Where are we going to get the water in all these Western states to cool these reactors? I think the next decade is going to be all about energy. Even Sam Altman from OpenAI had some recent recent hearing or talk where he talked about just the evolution of AI. And so you've got algorithms. Algorithms run on chips, but ultimately the chips need electricity. You know, when you talk about China has doubled their power. And so China said, let's let's double our grid. Let's Let's keep going. Let's work on tripling our grid. And we'll do it in the cheapest way possible because we want to win on manufacturing and get all this economic activity over here. Where are we going to get the water in all these Western states to cool these reactors? Luckily, the water, yeah, good question. Um, same question applies to data centers. So historically, a lot of data centers used evaporative cooling, and so you ran through a lot of water. The newer data centers are doing closed loop cooling. So no water evaporation. You do have big heat exchangers sitting outside, but you're not evaporating water to cool. And some of the very similar to data centers, some of the modern nuclear reactors, what people call these generation four reactors, just the latest in, you know, in technology, in safety, in cost, they also use closed loop cooling. So one of them, one, the ones we talked about, the shipping container size reactor, no water use. The fluids flowing around are other fluids like helium and CO2. And so to cool off, you just run it through a big fan and heat exchanger system, just like a radiator on a car. And so you don't need any water for cooling, so no water consumption. In fact, like if you can wow. get if you can get nuclear cheap enough and now we're now we're actually producing the electricity and using that for some purpose and we we have a bunch of thermal left over, could we use that thermal energy to do things like desalination? And so do you actually go from a something where you might think, okay, nuclear reactors, we're gonna use up a, a lot of water. And maybe the old old designs did use water, but the new ones don't. Could you actually go from, you know, water consumptive to actually water creating? Wow. Yeah, I think we're gonna see a lot of a lot of cool things. I think a lot of it's gonna be driven by energy. I think the next decade's gonna be all about energy. Even um, even Sam Altman from OpenAI had some recent recent hearing or talk where he talked about um, just the evolution of AI. And so you've got algorithms. Algorithms run on chips, but ultimately the chips need electricity. And what he said, if uh, thinking back to this interview, <laughs> the algorithms are going to get better and better and better and cheaper, and the chips will get cheaper and cheaper. But at the end of the day, you have to get the electrons, and the electrons have a fundamental price. And... Ultimately, it's going to come down to that. So I think even the AI, the AI competition between different companies in the U.S., between different countries, it's ultimately going to come back to the electricity production. So I think, yeah, next decade is going to be all about all about power production, AI, military. If if you think you need kinetics and military, that comes back to manufacturing. If you think economics, okay, we have to have the biggest economy so that we can just have the most productive capacity energy. So I think next decade is going to be all about energy. And we've stayed flat for a decade. For 15 years, we haven't done anything, more like 20 years. Our grid's been pretty stagnant. And if we want U.S. leadership, it's going to have to grow. So I think that's that's going to be the story we see. And it's going to be about solving different supply chain needs, whether it's it's fuel, maybe it's transformers, maybe it's transmission. All these things are going to come up. It's going to be chips. Are we actually, you know, when you talk about China has doubled their power or, or doubled doubled what we have, correct? Mm -hmm. Are they, I mean, they also have a lot more people. Yep. So are they, are they seeing the benefits of having that much more power production than we do? Or is it equivalent because they have so many more consumers of energy? I think a lot of that, um, we have to go back to that, that chart and see exactly where is China today? Where were they before in terms of per capita? But I think a lot of that production, the doubling of their grid relative to our grid, a lot of that's gone into manufacturing. And so, you know, we've shifted manufacturing from the U.S. to overseas. A lot of that's in China now. We've let them do it. You know, a big part of that people thought was, well, Chinese labor is much cheaper. But a lot of these processes can be automated. And so once you automate it, it just comes back to energy cost. And so China said, let's let's double our grid. Let's Let's keep going. Let's work on tripling our grid. And we'll do it in the cheapest way possible because we want to win on manufacturing and get all this economic activity over here. Meanwhile, the U.S. has said, 
Um, you know, we have a bunch of regulations which are good and probably some that are unnecessary and have slowed us down. And so we haven't done the growth and, you know, we've been very thoughtful about um, emissions, environmental impact, carbon. Meanwhile, China's doubling, tripling their grid and has done a lot of that with coal. And so we've shifted manufacturing here that would have been cleaner uh, over there and just probably ended up net producing more carbon than um, than we would have, more pollutants than we would have, and just kind of outsource that. But as we know, carbon flows everywhere. So if you're really worried about carbon emissions, letting China double their grid with coal and move manufacturing, energy intensive manufacturing there is not actually the answer. The answer is <clears throat> the U.S. has to unblock building here, doing industrial activity, do it cleanly, do it with nuclear or other sources, even natural gas, half the carbon emissions of coal. And the world would be way better off. And so I think their grid doubling hasn't just meant that everyone there has a better quality of life. I think it just means that we've taken a lot of manufacturing from here and done it over there. Gotcha. Gotcha. Do you have any insight on, from a consumer standpoint, just a household, how, what kind of energy prices can we expect, you know, when this, by 2030? It's going to depend a lot on what we, how we implement all this. So you have huge variation between states. So I think a lot of it comes down to regulation. Okay. So, you know, some states, you know, you've got retail electricity costs in the single digit sense. California, I think you can get into the 30s. So between states, you can be triple. So clearly that's not technology driven, that's regula regulatory okay. driven. And so I think a, a lot of how this plays out is going to be, what do we do on the regulatory side? We have cheap sources of energy. People could have them. You know, the grid is currently capable of shipping electricity to people's homes at the level that we consume them, consume electricity. So with net new sources coming on the grid, it should get cheaper. But that's going to depend on a lot of different factors. Um, it's going to depend on who sets the rates, um, how electricity is priced. Do you have some infrastructure costs and then some generation costs? So will there be separation of transmission and generation costs everywhere? Um, what is the balance between those two? How much are we paying for the transmission? How much are we paying for the generation? Um, there were some shifts in that in California where it was more bundled. And as people did more and more rooftop solar, I think it was separated because the utilities were having a harder time paying for their existing infrastructure. And so how that all goes in each state is going to be the real driver, I think. I think we have the ability to produce as much electricity as we want um, through all these different methods. But how that actually makes its way to people's homes depends on state level and federal level policy, as well as, as, well as things like uh, NEPA, which is the environmental regime for um, standardizing a lot of these federal approvals on large-scale infrastructure projects. Um, which which has slowed down things like new transmission lines. And so the degree to which that gets reformed or looked at, or how can we still have all the safety that we that we always had, that we want the envir environmental protections, but how can we streamline this to help things go faster? <clears throat> I think you're going to, you know, big, big picture, you've got two curves. You've got the demand curve and you've got the supply curve. And if the demand curve for electricity, whether it's AI data centers or people's homes, starts really outpacing supply, that's when prices go up. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.